Good morning, Horizons Church. Would you guys please stand with me? As we prepare to worship our living God today, we're called together in the words of Psalm 145, which says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and in his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend his works to another and shall declare his mighty acts. Come and let us worship our Lord. the greatest works that the Lord has done is to is the gift to allow us to come to him and repent and for him to forgive our sins and to reconcile us to him. So as we continue to praise and lift his name in greatness and to worship him, let's draw near to him and confess our sins together in the word of this prayer. Merciful Father, you have given us good laws and commands yet we have failed to keep them. We have sinned against you and our neighbors with our thoughts, words, and deeds, and we have failed to walk worthy of your name. Have mercy on us, O Lord, and grant us renewed repentance that we might live through you and for you. We ask this for the sake of your Son, Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, 
one God, now and forever. Amen. Would you guys please take a moment to silently confess any particular sins to God? My friends, if you've confessed your sins with faith in Christ, then hear this word of comfort from John 3.16, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Having heard those words of encouragement and confessed our sins, and knowing that our good Lord does forgive those who come to him, let us now lift our voices in praise again. Lord, I come. I confess, bowing here I find my rest, without you I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart, Lord I need you. into that, right? Friends, all of our worship that we lift to our Lord is in vain unless it's offered to the one true God by faith in Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. So let us now once again profess our faith in this triune God in the words of the Apostles' Creed in an answer to this question. Horizon Church, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one true church, the communion of saints, the resurrection of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Having proclaimed those truths in our one true God, let us lift our voices and praise again. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven, you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll be steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness. Unto the setting same I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. God from age to age, though the earth may pass away. Your word remains the same. Your history can prove there's nothing you can do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart burn when you speak a word. My anchor to the ground My hope 
rising sun to the setting same, I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. Amen to that. Would you guys pray with me? Father, we come to you on this wonderful day that you've blessed us with. Just an utter thanks that we know that your faithfulness in us and to us allows us to have salvation and allows us to have the comfort to rest in your loving arms. We thank you that no matter what this world throws at us, no matter what is going on, the darkness that's troubling all the families and different places throughout our world, we know that you are our firm foundation that we can stand on and that we can come to you and rest in knowing that you have won this battle and that the victory is yours. We thank you for that. And we ask that as we journey throughout this morning that the word that you've laid upon Pastor Lucas to deliver is received by everyone in the way that you intend and that we can carry that word out into the, into the world and apply your light in this darkness and be your messengers. We thank you and we love you. Amen. Would you guys please greet your neighbor before you find your seats? Well, good morning, my friends. I like to welcome each and every one of you here on this beautiful fall morning. It's getting pretty cold. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I would like it if it weren't for me needing a sweater in the morning and then shorts in the afternoon. So we're trying to figure that out and navigate that. Um, but anyhow, I'd love to welcome you here if this is uh, your first time, your new or recent. Um, Pastor Lucas is delivering the message today, and he'll be over here at our welcome area after the service. He'd love to meet you after the service, tell you a little bit about the church and how you can get involved. Um, and if we haven't had a chance to meet yet personally, my name's Gage Gregory. Um, I'm always venturing around, so I'd love to talk with you if you have a few minutes and you see me running, running around the church. I'm often back with the kids, so we can talk there if you'd like. So, um, One other cool thing I'd like to tell you guys about for uh, our in-service tools is we have a Horizons Church app. And on that app, there's all kinds of really cool uh, in-service tools you can utilize, like um, you can take notes and then email them to yourself. There's a digital connection card. You can also check out any of the past messages uh, on a live stream from anywhere. So if you've happened to miss some of the previous messages in this series, you can go catch up on those on that app. Um, and also on that app, we have the feature of you all being able to give to us. And again, I'd like to thank you guys. We thank you guys every week for this. And we really do mean um, without your fin financial generosity, what we do here would not be possible. Um, so if you'd like to continue partnering with us financially or to start doing so, you can do so by any of the four ways list listed on the screen there. Okay. Um, and then last part of the regular announcements is to my left over here is our prayer room. At any point during the service, if you feel the need for prayer, we'd love to pray for you. So you can head over there and there'll be some folks in there ready to pray for you, okay? Um, and then I just have two um, kind of out of the usual, out of the norm announcements that uh, we're going to talk about. So I don't know if some of you all have noticed some young men in the lobby and in, in the service wearing some pretty spiffy uniforms today. Um, so those uniforms are part of the Trail Life Troop 106, which meets here on Sunday evenings. And what this is, it's, it's kind of a group for young boys. So if you would be interested, if you're, you have young boys and would be interested in getting to learn more about that um, and see how this ministry can um, help, help your boy become a man of God and make a difference in, for Christ in these dark times. Um, the Trail Life's hosting an open house today at 6 p.m., so we'd love for you to come out and check that out. Um, and the other announcement outside of the norm is that uh, this comes from Pastor Valerie in the Children's Church. So if you have any youngins back in the back, um, four, five, and six room, the toddler room, any of the rooms, um, you may have noticed and you may have been told, but on our badges now, there's going to be um, a number up in the top corner of your badge. And that, that number is just so we have a better way of reaching you if something does 
need to be uh, talked about or if your child needs your assistance during the service. So um, be paying attention to the big screen. If, if a number does pop up, check your badge for your kid. And if that's your number, go ahead and head out. And that's our way of communicating with you instead of us trying to come in and like look for everyone because it's not easy to find you guys when we're sitting down and uh, the sermon's going on. So um, just keep an eye out for that. And if that does happen, go ahead and head out and check on your kiddos, okay? Um, and that's all for me. If you turn your attention to the big screens, Pastor Lucas will be up to uh, deliver the fifth message in this series. We are about to listen to a message taught from God's Word. This is one of the most important parts of our gathering. Therefore, we ask you to silence your cell phone, not engage in conversation, and not allow your child to cause a distraction. If your little one does create a distraction, we kindly ask you to respect those around you by taking your child to our clean, safe nursery using our family viewing area in the cafe, or one of our cry rooms located behind you, where you can see and hear everything, and your child will appreciate the extra freedom. Well, Douglas Botter made a name for himself pretty quickly in the late 1920s as one of the Royal Air Force's most exceptional pilots. He had the guts and he had the skills to pull off maneuvers that other pilots wouldn't even dare to attempt, and Douglas loved to push himself and his plane to the absolute limit. And so on December 14th of 1931, he climbed into the cockpit of his Bristol Bulldog biplane to do just that. And since there was no act of war happening at this time, Douglas was just preparing and he was practicing maneuvers and aerial acrobatics of all kinds to perform in air shows. So Douglas took off from Woodley Airfield and began twisting and turning and maneuvering his plane with his usual skill and precision. But on this particular day, Douglas decided to push the envelope just a little more than usual, and he tried to pull off a roll at ridiculously low altitude. Such low altitude that when Douglas began to flip his plane over and roll it, he clipped his left wing on the ground. And when he hit the ground, of course, he lost control of that plane, crashed it into the dirt, destroyed his plane, and it nearly destroyed Douglas in the process. It was nearly a fatal mistake. He was quickly rushed to the hospital where his injuries were examined, and he had suffered a great many of them in serious nature, but it turned out the worst of those injuries occurred to his legs. In the course of the crash, Douglas's legs had been completely crushed, and so when the doctors began looking at him and seeing what they could do to help him, they pretty quickly decided that they were going to have to amputate both of his legs one just above the knee and one just below. An emergency double amputation like this, that is life-altering, that is a big deal and serious in any day and age, but in 1931, this sort of thing was going to pretty much ensure that Douglas lived a very sedentary lifestyle from here on out. The doctors and no one else expected him to be able to do much of anything on his own for the rest of his life. But Douglas had some pretty different expectations of what he might be capable of. He expected himself and strived to be able to do the things he loved to do again. He loved to be able to, to walk and to drive on his own, to be able to do things like dance again. And to the absolute astonishment of the doctors, within just four months' time, Douglas had managed to walk, drive, and dance without assistance again on his own. And so that left him with only one thing left to do, and that was to get back into a plane. And after some convincing the RAF agreed to let Douglas fly again with supervision. And so Douglas, only months removed from this accident, was back in the cockpit after this horrific crash that almost cost him his life and did cost him his legs. And upon re-entering the cockpit, he really quickly demonstrated that he was just as good of a pilot as he has ever been. It hadn't had any effect on him at all, it seems. He twisted and turned and maneuvered that plane with the same skill and deftness that he always had. But... Even though Douglas quickly proved that he was still a very capable pilot, the RAF wasn't real sure what to do with him. They said that there was nothing in the King's regulations about his extraordinary case. And so they decommissioned Douglas and forced him out of the RAF. And so after having survived the accident that nearly killed him and that looked to have destroyed his dreams of becoming a fighter pilot, he was now forced to have his dreams destroyed because of some rules, or rather lack thereof, of double amputee pilots. And for roughly the next seven years, Douglas and his dreams stayed distant. They stayed out of his reach. He worked a mundane job, lived a fairly normal life, but he never gave up hope on becoming the fighter pilot that he knew he ought to be. 
and as tensions began to rise in Europe in the 1930s, Douglas continued to attempt to try and rejoin the RAF, but he was turned down time and time and time again. However, although the British military could ignore Douglas, they could not ignore the rising aggression and the tensions of Nazi Germany. And when du Britain declared war on Germany and entered World War II, Douglas knew that that was his opportunity to get back into the RAF, to get back into a plane, and be the pilot he knew he was meant to be. And fortunately, by this time, some of the men who had served with Douglas years earlier, they were his peers year earlier, they had now risen in the ranks a little bit. They had a little bit of influence and pull. And so when Douglas attempted to rejoin this time, those men used their influence to help get Douglas back in. And so on November 27th of 1939, just after Britain entered World War II, Douglas Botter was once again a pilot in the Royal Air Force. And this time... He wasn't just going to be practicing for air shows. There was a real threat. There was a real war where he could put his skills to use. But although Douglas was the best of the best when he was decommissioned years earlier, he had some catching up to do. Things had changed a little bit because over the last seven, eight years by this time, technology had advanced a little bit. The RAF was using new planes now. And so Douglas had not a lot of familiarity with some of the new technology and new planes. And so what he would be flying was no longer one of these old school biplanes that looked more like a crop duster than anything else. He was going to be flying a new plane known as the Spitfire, which was far superior in every way to the planes that he was used to. And so the RAF wanted to see what he was capable of in these planes because he hadn't flown much at all now for the last seven, eight years, better part of a decade. And not only had he not flown much at all, but he was now a double amputee, hadn't spent much time in a plane after having that double amputation, and he was flying a new plane. And so they weren't sure how that was all going to go. And so they trained him a little bit and then had him pass a flight test. And Douglas, having all those things against him, you know, double amputee now, new plane, not having flown much, he gets back in the pilot and immediately demolishes the flight test. Absolute flying collars, perfectly. He was maneuvering his plane in ways that not even Douglas could believe. He was banking harder and turning tighter than was imaginable for him before. And all of his peers and, and uh, uh, you know, higher-ups were very impressed with what he could pull off. And what Douglas originally attributed his incredible maneuvers to is he just thought it was the new planes. He just thought the new Spitfires were so far superior that they allowed him to do things that he was doing. But... What he noticed and what others quickly noticed is that not all of Douglas's peers could pull off the same maneuvers and the same twists and turns and banks that Douglas could. Because as it turned out, Douglas's accident and his disability turned out to be a massive advantage for him. See, his peers couldn't do what Douglas did because they were affected by G-force significantly more than Douglas was. See, when they tried to turn hard and to bank tight, the blood would be poured, forced from their head down into their lower extremities, and they had to be careful to not pass out, to not turn too hard or bank too tight, because they would pass out in the cockpit from the blood being pushed to their lower body. Douglas didn't have anywhere for the blood to go. Quite literally, his lack of legs, his double amputation, gave him a significantly higher tolerance to G-force in the cockpit. And so he was able to put himself in his plane in far more strained situations than anybody else could. And so what looked like it was going to be a massive disability for Douglas turned out to be a literal superpower in the cockpit. He was able to do moves that nobody else could possibly pull off. And so after having firmly established that he was more than capable to pilot these new planes, his first mission was to help establish and hold air superiority over Dunkirk, where the British military was evacuating. That was a success. And because of Douglas's exceptional performance during that mission, he was given command of a squadron of fighters of his own. And that promotion would be the first of a long line of accolades during his military career. Douglas was credited over about the next two years with an incredible 22 enemy planes being downed by 1941 with several more probables. He was beloved by the men who served over, under him. He became a war hero. He became an inspiration to multitudes of people. And when the story of the double amputee fighter pilot Ace began to spread, they made a movie about Douglas Botter, and he became one of the most famous veterans in all of World War II. And he didn't use that fame to just gain notoriety for himself or to make himself a lot of money. What Douglas decided to do with that fame is to be an advocate for people with disabilities, to be an advocate for those with, with difficulties such as himself. 
And that work proved to be an extremely effective work for him to do because in 1976, he was knighted for that work. He was, became Sir Douglas Botter because of his advocacy and his work for the disabled community and people with conditions such as himself. What I find amazing is all of Douglas's greatest accomplishments, all the good work that led to him being knighted and what we remember him has today happened not only because he endured the pain of the accident that cost him his legs, but because that accident gave him an advantage over other people. The very thing that appeared to destroy his chances of being pilot turned out to be what made him a better pilot than he ever could have imagined. And the very thing that looked like it had ended his hopes and dreams turned out to be the thing that increased in his impact and his influence more than he ever could have imagined. And I'm pretty sure that if you would have asked Douglas right after that accident, if he would like to go back and change that, if he would like to go back before he lost his legs, I'm sure he would have said, absolutely, yes, I would like to go back and change that. But had that not happened, he would have never become the man he's remembered as today. He would have never been able to make the difference for people with disabilities like himself. He may have been a good fighter pilot. He wouldn't have been as good of a pilot. And so all of this great work that he did would never have occurred. I'm sure that that was hard, difficult, and painful for Douglas to endure. And I'm sure that all of us, we deal with hard things, painful things, difficult things to endure. I'm sure that all of us, we deal with things like that that we wish we could change. We wish we could go back before that happened to us. And I'm sure that if you do have something like that in your life that you wish would be different, I'm sure that you've probably asked God to change that thing for you too. But what if I told you that the thing that you wish you could change the most and be read of the most, what if that was the key to you making the biggest impact possible? What if God could turn the thing that you think is holding you back into the reason that you make a difference? And throughout this series, we've talked about how the grace of God gives us what we need to do, what we uh, don't have what it takes to do. And today we're going to talk about the grace of God, close this series, but we're going to talk about this grace from a little bit of a different angle. Because so far, when we talked about the grace of God, it's been a lot of active, how we go out and make things happen, how the grace of God empowers us, enables us to go out and make stuff happen. Well, today we're going to talk about how the grace of God helps us to endure when things happen to us. Not necessarily when we're trying to make them happen, but when stuff happens to us, how does the grace of God come to us and how does it aid us in that sort of situation? Because there's probably something painful in your life that is happening to you that you would change if you could, but you can't. And maybe God has so far said no when you've asked Him to change it. And so we're going to look at today how God's grace gives us what we need to endure and how His grace can not only help us endure, but how it can turn an affliction into an asset. And I think the clearest example of how this works in Scripture comes to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And so that's where we're going to be. You can begin turning there, and that leads us to this first principle. God's grace is sufficient for us to endure the painful things we can't change and He doesn't remove. God's grace is sufficient for us to endure the painful things that we can't change and the painful things that He doesn't remove. So we're going to spend the majority of our time, 2 Corinthians 12, in verses 7 through 9, roughly. However, what we're going to read is going to make a lot more sense if you have a little bit of context. And there's a lot going on in this passage. There's, a, there's a, uh, a lot to untangle and a lot to unpack. And so we're going to do that little by little throughout the message. So bear with me as we do that. But what you need to know right off the bat is we're going to pick up about two-thirds of the way through verse 7. But what Paul spends the first seven verses, all but the very end of verse 7, talking about here is how... God has given him these surpassingly great revelations. That's how he starts the chapter, that he was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body, they're out of the body, he doesn't know. But he was caught up to the third heaven. He saw things that he can't describe. He heard things that he can't tell anybody about. He was given surpassingly great visions and incredible revelation. And then Paul says in verse 7 that he was also given something else. It wasn't only these revelations he was given. He was giving something else in addition to these revelations and to these visions. And so about two-thirds of the way through verse 7, let's look and see what Paul says was given to him in addition to those revelations. He says, I was given the revelations, and also I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
And therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. This is a really famous passage, and for good reason. But one of the main reasons that this is a famous passage is it raises a lot of questions, a lot of problems. Paul says, I was given revelations, and I was also given a thorn. But what is a thorn? What is Paul's thorn in the flesh here? What does he mean when he says, I was given a thorn, a messenger of Satan, something to torment me? I think the first thing that we can find out just by the simple powers of observation is, I don't know if you've ever had the distinct displeasure of crashing into a briar bush or accidentally grabbing a hold of one, but it hurts. That is unpleasant. It is painful. You run a thorn in your hand or in your arm or somewhere, it is very painful to have that happen. And so the first thing we can ascertain just by looking at what Paul says is, this is clearly something painful. It's very unpleasant for Paul. And if you're not sure about that just by reading the thorn, he also calls this thing a messenger of Satan. Satan has never sent any messengers with anything good. Never. Not one time. So you can rest assured that whatever this is that Paul's dealing with, this thorn in the flesh, this messenger of Satan, it is painful, it hurts, it is unpleasant. We can know that just by how he describes it. But there's a lot of theories about exactly what this is. A lot of different theories. Because Paul never tells us exactly what it is. He doesn't tell us here and nowhere else in Scripture do we read it saying, oh, here's exactly what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. So some people say that this was some sort of temptation or sin that Paul just couldn't shake. Some people say that this was some sort of an emotional wound that Paul dealt with that he couldn't get healing for. That this was some sort of maybe opponent in his ministry. But the majority of the people, and myself included, I believe that this was quite literally a thorn in Paul's flesh, meaning that this was a physical ailment. This was a physical problem. This was some sort of sickness or disease or physical malady that Paul had to deal with. I think that's what it was. But even within that category, there's a lot of debate over exactly what sort of affliction, physical problem this was. And again, the Bible doesn't tell us, but it does give us some clues. In the book of Galatians, we get some clues as to maybe what this is and what I think is probably the best guess at what Paul's thorn was. The first clue we get is in Galatians 4. Paul's talking about his time with the church in Galatia, and he's talking about how he was sick. He had this illness when he was with them. And they welcomed him anyway. They took care of him while he was there, even while he was sick and battling with this physical affliction that he had during his time in Galatia. And so in verse 15... We read this, Paul saying, I was sick, you took care of me, you looked out for me, you, you, you really tried to help me everywhere you could. And then in verse 15, Galatians 4, he says, I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Now, why would they tear out their eyes? I think probably because there was something wrong with Paul's eyes. That's the only thing that makes any sense to me. It makes no sense to tear out your eyes and give them to somebody if they, you know, are just sad. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to tear out your eyes and give them to somebody if they have a broken leg. I think probably this is an indication that whatever this physical affliction Paul's dealing with was an eye problem. We get a second clue that kind of points the same direction later at the end of Galatians. In Galatians chapter 6, Paul's kind of writing his final encouragements and given his final instructions. And the way these letters were written down, Paul usually, he wasn't usually the one actually with the pen in his hand putting the pen to paper. Usually he was dictating it and somebody else, a scribe, was writing down what Paul was dictating. But that changes right at the end of Galatians. In chapter 6, verse 11, we read this. Paul says, See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. So now Paul has got the pen. He's the one doing the writing. He's not just dictating anymore. He is writing these letters himself. And he says, see what large letters I write to you with. Now, why would Paul use large letters? Could be that he just is really wanting the Galatian church to understand that this is serious. What he's saying here is like, give me that pen. I'm writing this myself. This is in bold. I want you to hear it. Pay attention. That could be it. I think probably it's maybe more likely that Paul had a problem with his eyes and therefore was writing in big old letters because his eyes didn't work right. There was something wrong with his eyes. Just two chapters earlier, he said, you would have torn out your eyes and given to me if you could have. And so when you put these two things together and you consider the fact that there's nothing else in the rest of Paul's letters or the rest of Scripture that talks about this issue, this thorn or any sort of sickness or illness, I think 
that is the most likely explanation. It's not 100% proof, but I think that's the most likely explanation. But I think that even if you don't buy that it was specifically an eye problem, I think it's relatively clear and fairly certain that this was some sort of physical affliction. This wasn't a besetting sin, and we'll talk more about why I don't think that's true later, but this wasn't an emotional wound. This, this was a physical problem that Paul dealt with. I think that's what the evidence points to, of the, best, uh, the best guess we have with the evidence that we have. But regardless of what sort of physical affliction this was for Paul, whether it had anything to do with his eyes or not, whatever it was, Paul clearly had absolutely no ability to fix this himself. He couldn't do anything about it. And he apparently couldn't find anybody else to do anything about it. He couldn't find any sort of cure for it at all. Because the great apostle Paul says, I was given a thorn in my flesh, and he says that he prayed three times, he pleaded with God for healing, and yet he wasn't healed. Now you would think that if Paul being healed had anything to do with him living a righteous life, or with him having enough faith, or with Paul being qualified and having the right abilities and the right pedigree, you would think that if it had anything to do with any of those things, this would have been healed the second it started bothering him. Because if anybody could check the boxes of, I have faith, I have been living righteously, I've been doing the right thing, if anybody could check those boxes, it was Paul. And yet, Paul says, I prayed three times and I wasn't healed. God did all kinds of miracles through Paul. All kinds of miracles. We read in Acts 19, Acts 19 verses 11 through 12, it says this, it said, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. Paul, people are being healed through Paul, and Paul's not there. Paul's not laying hands on these people. Paul's not praying for these people. They are taking Paul's napkins that have just touched him, and they are taking them to people who are sick and who have evil spirits, and they're laying Paul's napkins on these people, and they're being healed. And he's not even there. Paul's not even there. They're just taking stuff that's touched him to people who are sick. And they're being healed and demons are being cast out. That's incredible. You would think that that guy, the guy whose napkins are healing people, that guy's going to be healed of whatever he asks for, right? I mean, he has got the anointing of God on him like you've never, you couldn't believe. He is obviously being empowered by the Holy Spirit. The power of God's resting on him. Obviously, that guy's going to get healed, right? And if not Paul, I mean, if Paul couldn't pray for himself and be healed, why not somebody Paul knew? Paul spent time with incredible believers. He sent people who were incredible church leaders, who were faithful Christians. He spent a lot of time with other apostles. So why couldn't one of those guys pray for Paul? Why couldn't he be healed if those guys are praying for him? The, the, the apostles. How could it even possibly be true that a guy like that with that kind of power, with that kind of anointing, with that kind of friends, those kind of people around him praying for him, how could it even possibly be that Paul would be left to suffer with something like this? How could that be true? And yet that's exactly what he says. He says, I prayed three times. God said no three times. And I think what that makes abundantly clear is that Paul was never the one doing the healings. Paul was never the one casting out the spirits. God was doing that work through Paul, but it wasn't up to Paul. Because if that sort of thing was up to Paul, I'm willing to bet Paul would have healed himself. But it wasn't up to Paul. And when it says that he prayed three times, I don't think that means that Paul one day, you know, offered three quick prayers. I don't think that's talking about how Paul, you know, three times he said, uh, Lord, would you please heal me, and then went on with his day. I don't think that's what it says when he says he prayed three times, because it says that he pleaded with God. I don't know if you've ever pleaded with God, but if you are pleading with God, that is a long, arduous, that happens over a period of time. And so what I think is happening here is not three quick prayers from Paul. I think these are three periods of time in his life, three seasons, whatever you want to call it, that Paul earnestly pleaded with God for healing time after time after time after time. And yet God said no. He didn't remove the thorn in Paul's flesh. But he did answer Paul. God did answer Paul. God said, I'm not going to heal you, but I will give you the grace you need to endure. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. 
for my power is made perfect in weakness. He didn't leave Paul twisting in the wind. He said, I'm not going to take that thing away from you, but I will give you what you need to endure it. And I'm sure Paul would have said, I would have rather been healed. I would have rather been healed than just be given the grace I need to endure it. But that wasn't God's plan. That wasn't what he was doing. He said, I'll give you the grace you need to endure the thorn, but I'm not going to remove it. And I think it's probably a good thing we don't know exactly what that thorn is. Because if we knew what it was, we would really narrow it down and say, oh, God's grace is sufficient for that specific thing. You know, it's sufficient for eye problems only because we know that's what Paul had. And so God's grace is sufficient there. But that's not the point. The point is not that God's grace is sufficient for just Paul's issue. The point is that God's grace is sufficient for thorns in our life, whatever shape or form they may come in. That His grace is sufficient for you and I to endure. His power is made perfect in weakness, whatever our weakness may look like. But I will also say that although thorns come in many shapes and sizes, not everything is a thorn. Not everything is. Not every sort of malady or sickness or difficult or hard thing that's painful in our life, they're not all thorns. There are some defining marks of what this kind of affliction, this kind of thorn is. And I think the defining mark is what we can see clearly in Paul's case is that Paul was entirely and completely powerless to do anything about this affliction. He was completely powerless. He could not heal himself. He could not find anybody to do it for him. He was powerless. Some people will say that Paul's thorn in the flesh, and some people will say that you know a thorn in the flesh is a besetting sin. Some sort of sin that we just can't seem to shake, we can't seem to get rid of. It just hangs around and lingers, and we're just stuck with this besetting sin. Some people would say that's a thorn in the flesh. I don't believe that's true. Because we are not powerless against sin. We're powerless against thorns. We are not powerless against sin. And so I do not think that besetting sins fit into the category of thorns in the flesh like we're talking about here today. Besetting sins, they cause pain, they cause a lot of hurt. They will certainly hurt your impact, your influence. They will, they will bring a lot of, uh, of hurt into your life. But they're not a thorn because you're not powerless. Because you believing that you're powerless against some besetting sin is exactly what the devil would want you to believe. He would want you to believe that you can't do anything about it. The devil would want you to believe that you're completely powerless. He would want you to believe that you're held captive and you always will be and there's nothing that you can do about it. But that's not true. You are not powerless against sin. And so besetting sins are not thorns. They bring a lot of hurt and pain, but you're not powerless against them. And so that's not a real legitimate thorn in the flesh. I believe that to be a lie from Satan. But if you do have a real legitimate thorn in the flesh, some sort of messenger of Satan, you can rest assured that God's words are the same to you as they were to Paul. He says to you, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And by the grace of God, you can endure whatever that affliction is. But even knowing that God's grace is sufficient, it doesn't answer the question for us, why was Paul not healed? Even though God's grace is sufficient, that's great, but why didn't God just take care of this? And why doesn't he do it for us? I mean, he's capable of doing it, right? God's absolutely capable of healing whatever thing we got, whether it be an emotional wound, whether it be a physical problem, whether it be a mental illness, whatever it may be, whatever kind of shape or form that thorn might take, God's capable of getting rid of it. So why doesn't he? That leads us to this last truth. When God refuses to remove your thorn, his grace is sufficient to redeem your thorn. When God refuses to remove it, His grace is sufficient to redeem it. Now, in a rare turn of events in our passage, we get to actually read and see clearly the why here. We don't usually get to see the why. We actually get to see the why in 2 Corinthians 12. As I said earlier, Paul spends the first several verses talking about these great revelations that he's been, these visions that he's seen, and then he talks about, oh, I was given this thorn in the flesh. But in between the two, in between talking about these great revelations and this thorn in the flesh, Paul links them. Paul makes this quick little statement, and he links the two together, and we get to see the why. We get to see why God didn't heal him, why he left him with this, this affliction that he had to suffer with. 2 Corinthians 12, still in verse 7, just backing up just a little bit. Paul says, I was given these great revelations, and therefore in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. 
Paul says, I was given great revelations, and because I was given these great revelations, surpassingly great revelations, and these incredible visions, and because I've seen things I can't tell you about, and I've heard things that I can't repeat, because of that, I was given a thorn in my flesh to keep me from becoming conceited. The thorn served to keep Paul humble. And I find it amazing that Paul can see that. Paul recognizes here, he recognizes this thing as both from God, doing good work in him, and also a messenger from Satan in the same sentence. He said in the same sentence, Paul says both of those things are true. That's kind of astonishing to me. I would think those things would be mutually exclusive, but apparently they're not. Paul says this is a messenger from Satan, and God's using it to do good work. And that just goes to show that God can use even the attacks of the enemy to do good work in us. Even attacks of the enemy, God can turn around and use for good in our lives. He used a messenger for Satan to keep Paul humble. And Paul was able to see that and recognize it. Paul was able to see and recognize that this hurts, it's a thorn in my flesh, it's a messenger from Satan, and yet I was given it to keep me humble, to keep me from becoming conceited. But I will say that even though Paul could see that, I bet if you would have asked him, I bet if you would have asked him, he could have given you a list, maybe even a pretty lengthy list, of how he could be more effective in his ministry, how he could do more good work for the kingdom of God, how he could advance the the gospel to even greater degrees if he didn't have this thorn in the flesh. I bet he could have told you a lot of reasons why he would be better off without it. A lot of them. Because this thing, it, it clearly caused him pain. It clearly caused him to have to slow down. When he's with the church in Galatia, he says, you had to care for me. I wasn't taking care of you. You were taking care of me because this thing had just knocked me out. It was clearly a hindrance to Paul. And yet, Paul was better off with it than without it. And Paul was more effective with this affliction than he was without that affliction. And that's true because God can use and He does use humble people who've got thorns, disabilities, and afflictions. God uses those kind of people. His power is made perfect in weakness. That's the kind of people God uses. But God doesn't use the kind of people who are highly capable and have the egos to match. God doesn't use those kind of people. In fact, if you want the most surefire way, if you want a 100 percenter on how to torpedo your usefulness and effectiveness in the kingdom of God, if you want a way to absolutely sink that ship, pride and being conceited, is a 100 percenter. Remember what we talked about at the beginning of the series from James? James says this, chapter 4, verse 6, says, but he gives more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Pride's a 100 percenter if you want to torpedo your usefulness in the kingdom of God. Because James says, God doesn't just not aid the proud. It's not like God just doesn't help them. God actively opposes the proud. He actively stands against the proud. And if you're intimidated and a little spooked by the idea of a messenger or Satan might be after you, you should be incredibly terrified of standing in opposition to God Almighty. That is the worst place you can possibly be. The worst place you can possibly be is in opposition to God Almighty. And James says, that's where you stand if you are proud. God opposes the proud, but He gives grace and shows favor to the humble. And so this thorn served to keep Paul humble. And God gives us grace, and God gave Paul grace, not only to endure the thorns in our life, but he used those thorns. He used them so that we could be more usable, so that we can be more effective, just like he did for Paul. Where he doesn't remove the thorns, God redeems them. And I think it's only through the grace of God that you and I and Paul the way Paul was able and the way you and I hopefully will be able to see this thorn as something that's doing good work in our life, as a conduit for the power of God. I think that's a grace because that doesn't make any sense to us in our heads. The the math doesn't work. I mean, if I was God and Paul is my, you know, A player, which Paul was kind of the A player, if I want that guy to be as effective as he can, I'm going to make sure that guy stays untouchable. I don't want to weaken that guy. Why would I want to weaken that guy? That guy's the A player. I want him to be as strong as he can possibly be, in the best shape he can possibly be. I don't want Satan to touch that guy because he is my A player. He is the most effective dude I've got. And yet that's not at all what God does. That's not at all what God does for Paul. 
But God's not looking for people who think they can do it all by themselves. God is not looking for people who think they have all the skills, all the abilities, all the strength to do whatever he asks them to do without his help. God opposes the proud, but he empowers the weak and the humble to advance his kingdom. And in order to keep Paul in that weak and humble category, the thorn was given him. The thorn was given him so that he would remain weak and humble, and then God gave him grace to see that good work that God was doing through the thorn. Because he could have removed it. He could have removed that thorn. But instead, he gave Paul the grace he needed to endure, and he used it to do good work. And interestingly enough, there's an old Roman emperor that had a phenomenal quote, summed up what we're talking about really, really well. Not a Christian, but he's got a phenomenal quote. Marcus Aurelius said this, The impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. What stands in the way becomes the way. The obstacle is the way. The very thing that you think stops you is what's used to propel you forward. Thorns make you weak. But whenever you're weak, the power of Christ rests on you all the more and you are strong. The very thing that you think stops you is the very thing that propels you forward. So why would God not remove this thing from Paul? Why wouldn't he take this affliction? Because it was better for Paul that God redeem it than remove it. That's why. And I know that wrapping our heads around this theoretically, when we're all, you know, just, oh yeah, I can think I can get my head around this, how this is probably true, that's one thing. But it's a different thing entirely whenever you've got to look in the mirror and it's happening to you. And you've got to try to hear God's no. And you've got to try and sort out why God isn't taking it for you. And you've got to sort out why God's allowing this sort of pain in your life. That's different. It's a whole lot easier to see what God's doing in other people's pain for them. Way easier. A lot more difficult when it's us. And I know that from personal experience. If you're thinking, oh, sure, it's easy for you to say all this. You don't know what it's like. My thorn, that thing hurts. That is painful. It is a hindrance. You don't know what you're talking about. This thing has is, is got me down. I do know what you're talking about. As many of you know, I've dealt with various health issues now for seven or eight years. And it has changed. It's morphed. But it has caused me pain. It has been a hindrance to me. It has slowed me down, caused me to have to sit down sometimes and just take a break. And I would certainly like to be rid of it. I would love for that to change. I would love for God to take that away. And for seven or eight years now, I have prayed literally every single day that God would heal me. Every day. And a lot of days, I have prayed multiple times a day that God would heal me. And not only have I prayed, my wife, we've been married almost five years now, she's prayed every day that God would heal me. My parents have prayed for me every day that God would heal me. And yet, going on eight years now, God has not healed me. I've still got whatever is wrong with me, wrong with me. My body still doesn't work the way it should. Even though I've prayed every day. I prayed every day. And God has said no. Every day. He's given me stretches of relief, periods of relief, where I feel pretty decent. For some days are better than others. Some weeks are better than others. But yet He's continued to say no. But what I will say is that God has always given me grace and He has given me the strength I need to do what I have to do and to do what He has asked me to do, even when I don't feel like I have it. Even on the days where I am not feeling my best, I don't have my best, the thorn is really sore that day, God has given me grace to do what He's asked me to do, even when I'm 100% sure that I don't have what it takes. And although I would love for Him to heal me, I can see how God has used this to teach me things that I don't know how I would have learned any other way. He's shown me His faithfulness time and time and time and time again over the course of the last seven or eight years. He's continued to enable me to do things that I don't think I can do. And again, I would love for Him to heal me, but this has most certainly been something that is weakness, feels like a weakness to me, and yet God has displayed His power through that. Many, many, many times. And He's always given me grace. Because my physical limitations and this affliction and exactly what I've got is not the point. That wasn't the point for Paul. It's not the point for me. But I think I would be better off without it. 
I can list a lot of reasons that I could be more effective, a lot of reasons that I could do better and bigger ministry. I could write better sermons. I could do more work. I could, I could you know, spend time with more people. I could do a lot of stuff better, even in my own personal life. I was like, man, what I could be doing if I didn't have this bothered me all the time. And yet, it also might be true that I'm better off with it than without. It might be my version of a thorn in the flesh. And I haven't been given any great revelations like Paul has. But this might be something that, in my weakness, God is going to show himself to be strong through my weaknesses. And so I'm going to continue to pray that God heals me. And if you've got something like this going on in your life, you can do the same. You can continue to pray that God heals you. And if God does heal me, you'll hear about it. I'm going to throw a party. You will know. But if he doesn't, if he doesn't heal me, if he doesn't remove this thing, if he chooses, chooses to redeem it instead, I'm going to trust that he knows what he's doing. I'm going to continue to ask for the grace I need to endure. I'm going to trust that in my weakness he is strong. But I will admit that I'm not sure I'm quite as far down the road with this as Paul was. Because Paul says that he didn't just tolerate this. Paul didn't just come to terms with God saying no to him. Paul said that he gloried. Paul said that he boasted in his weakness, in his thorn. I'm not sure if I'm there. Paul says that given the choice between being healed and staying how I am, I'll stay how I am because I'm more effective that way. That's what Paul said. I think we ought to strive to be where Paul is, but I'd say that a lot of us, if not all of us, probably aren't there. Paul boasted and he gloried in his weakness. And God gave him grace and power because of that. And so if you're dealing with something like this, you don't have to stop praying for healing. But you do have to be willing to hear God's no. You cannot shake your fist and be bitter towards God and be angry towards God because He hasn't taken the thorn. Whatever it is, whether it's a physical problem, a mental illness, an emotional wound, whatever it is, God doesn't give grace to people who think they could do His job better than He's doing it. God gives grace to people who are humble, who can hear His no and trust that He knows what He's doing. And so if you want to be a conduit for the power of God and you want the grace of God to flow through you and in you, you must be humble. And if you're thinking, well, I don't have a thorn. I've never had a thorn. I don't really even know what you're talking about. If that's you and you're like, I can't relate to this at all. Congratulations. That's really good for you. Stay humble. <laughs> don't put yourself in a position to need a thorn, all right? Because they hurt. But I would imagine that there's probably not a lot of us in that category. There's probably not a lot of us who can look at our lives and say, oh yeah, there's nothing that just keeps hanging around and lingering around that I can't do anything about, that nobody can do anything about. There's nothing like that. And so whatever your thorn is, you might think you'd be better off without it. You might have a list of reasons that you'd be better off without it. You might think, oh God, if you would just take this away from me, then I could really serve you. Then I could really do what you want me to do. And that might be the exact opposite of the truth. Maybe God's plan, if you've got one of these things that feels like a thorn, maybe God's plan is for your healing. Maybe you're thinking, man, I, I sure feel like that's a thorn. I'm not 100% sure, but feels like one. Maybe God's going to heal you. Maybe God's going to remove it. He might do that. But He might not. Because maybe His plan isn't for your healing. Maybe His plan isn't for you to have a pain-free, thorn-free life. Maybe He's going to use that thing. He's going to redeem that thing. He's going to use your weakness to clearly display His strength. And the very thing that you think is the reason that you can't be effective is going to be the reason you're more effective than you could have ever imagined. Maybe the obstacle is the way. It was the way for Douglas. The obstacle was the way. The obstacle was the way for Paul. It might be true for you and I as well that the obstacle is the way. Because we're stronger when we're convinced that we don't have what it takes. We are stronger when we are convinced of our weakness. And we therefore lean into and rely on the grace of God to do things that we know we can't do without Him. That is when we are strongest. That is when we are most effective. And so I would encourage you to continue to pray for the grace you need to endure Continue to pray for the grace to see the obstacle is the way. To see the good work that God is doing through the thorn, through the thing that is hurting you, causing you pain. 
And be willing to hear his no. You have to be willing to hear no. Because maybe he'll heal you and maybe he won't. But you've got to be willing to submit to his plan. And it might not be the most comfortable. But I can assure you he knows what he's doing. And if you keep asking him, he'll give you the grace to see that he's doing good work through that thing that you wish you could get rid of. And so let's stand, let's sing together, and lean into the grace of God. Were creation suddenly articulate With a thousand tongues to lift one cry Then from north to south and east to west We hear Christ be magnified And strong and worship you And if it puts me in the fire I'll rejoice cause you're there too I won't be formed by feelings I hold fast to what is true And if the cross brings transformation I'll be crucified with you Cause death is just a doorway To resurrection life if I join you in your sufferings, then I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory, all the angels and the saints, oh, my heart will still be singing, and my soul will be the same. Oh, Christ be magnified, let his praise arise. Christ and pray with me. 
Father, we come before you recognizing our weakness, admitting that we do not have what it takes. And so, Father, I pray that you fill in all the gaps where we're insufficient, that you strengthen us where we're weak, that through our weaknesses you would show yourself to be strong. And Father, I pray that we would have the humility to serve you in whatever ways that you would ask us, that we would have the humility to hear no if your plan's not for the removing of thorns. And Father, I pray that you would continue to pour out your grace on us so that we can be effective, so that we can make a difference, so that we can bring people to know you as their Lord and Savior and so that they might find salvation in Jesus Christ. So Father, use us weak as we are and continue to give us grace to endure the hard things that life throws at us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. I hope you have a fantastic week. And if you're new or recent or want to chat, I'll be right over there.